In the last lecture, I introduced the tiny encryption algorithm, which I put again here on the slide. Now, what this lecture is about is giving you a flavor of how Cook analysis works. And for that, I'm going to show you some small variations of, these algorithm, of this algorithm and then show you how to break it. I'm not saying that these were ever proposed. These are just uh, basically as teaching tools. It's a very simple algorithm this way. It's also still a very simple algorithm with the, motive, uh, with the variations. And you can see how things can go wrong. So you're getting a flavor of what we normally do when we, uh, well, when we analyze these schemes and what you must do in order to get, gain confidence that while well, you're actually looking at a peer. Okay, so what we have here. So that's TA. And now we're going to change one thing. Notice, okay, let me do this again. So this is TA and this is, well, XOR TA, so you can already see it here. Um, the only change is that all the pluses in the updates of X and Y have changed from plus to XOR. Um, I'm not updating this in the definition of C because, I mean, then C would just be bouncing between two values because, well, you have to do it twice and get back to zero. So that would not be good. But in the updates for X and for Y, you could think, okay, well, XORs are a little bit faster in hardware than uh, additions mod 32, uh, to the 32, so let's just do that. Now, why could this be a problem? When you look at what happens with the bits, and when you're trying to trace through all the bits, and this is really, in symmetric cryptography, there's a lot of taking out your pencil and poking at different positions and seeing how the things work. You might prefer this to do this with a circuit diagram, you might do this with C code, or you just, well, write down what the state is and what currently is contained in there. And then you see that, well, the operations which we're using here are all linear operations. So when you're adding two numbers mod two, so each position is now without a carry, um, that's a linear operation in the input bits. We're XORing the key into some shifts of the Ys. Also the, the shifts are just linear operations on it. So when you trace this all the way through to, well, what is output after those 32 rounds, these are linear functions in the input bits and of course involving the key bits. For instance, if you look at the first output bit, there is a one, so the plus ones when they appear come from the constant C that is being added in. It's an odd number and so every once in a while, well, you add it in and then okay, two times C will be an even number and so on. So it's not always adding a one, but okay, for this first bit, there is a one. Then there's a clump which involves the key bits And then there's a bunch which involves the output, uh, the input bits. So B0 till B31 are in X and B32 till B63 are in Y. Now you don't know what these keys are, I mean, what these key bits are. The way that you normally uh, have access to this is you can feed it some input and you get some output, or you can observe input output pairs. And then you can draw conclusions from it. Now there's a lot of bits about the key in here, um, but well, it's 128 bits of the key and you can have lots and lots of input output bits. So you can come up with a gigantic matrix and maybe, well, solve for the keys. If your task is just to distinguish whether you're looking at the PRP or not, remember that was our security notion for block ciphers, is this a pseudo random permutation? Then this gives you an extra, an, an easier task. So if you observe this, and you're taking two of those numbers, say you're taking um, two input bits, while well, you're looking at two pairs, and then while well, the key bits are the same because you're just seeing two outputs of the same function, and also the one is the same, so all of this clump here would be the same, and then you would have these parts depend on the bits. Now, one thing is maybe you can craft your two messages, so if you're allowed to craft messages, you can craft them so that these two are the same, and then you can see, okay, well, this is really not a random function, or you do this even on a bigger scale, well, since all bits are linear, you can come up with uh, four blocks which have the properties that they are, well, each other's, so if it x or b1, b2, then it's the same as b3, b4, so these b's are now 64-bit blocks. 
So if you have this property and then you apply the XOR TA on this, which is a linear operation, the linearity should be maintained. So if you get these input bits, then you should observe this property on the output bits. And that would be very, very unusual for a POP to have. And if you don't think it's unusual enough for one uh, four tuple, you do it for another four tuple and for another four tuple until you have enough confidence that this is really not a PRP. Okay, so sticking with just linear operations is generally a bad thing. So yes, it's very important that a, a TAA is using pluses here, there, and not XORs. So this is the normal TAA again, and now we're going to do a different change. What I'm going to do now is turn it into left T. Now this was an even smaller change, so let me flip back. You see the only line is that the second input line for the updates of x and y is changing from a right shift to a left shift. Oops. So the normal TA has a right shift for the y and oops, this should the y there as well. No, that's right. It's yeah for the sorry, for the second one uh, has a right shift by five and the left TA has a left shift. Okay. It's another thing to simplify. It's another thing. Well. Maybe you prefer left shifts because this right shift with a division by 32 is not really division by 32 or whatever the reason. So let's look at what the effects are of this. So when you're looking at the, the addition, now it's proper integer addition, well, 1 to 32. So the problem that we saw in the previous one is gone. But if you look at the last bit, then, okay, the carries only affect the higher order bits. The, the first bit, I mean, if you're adding two odd numbers, you're getting that the first bit, the bottom bit is zero. If you're adding an odd number to an even number, the bottom bit is one. If you're adding two even numbers, the bottom bit is zero. So the two cases where the bottom bit is zero can have a carry if both of them were odd, or no carry if both of them were even. But you can still have, you can still observe that this is a linear operation. So let's just focus on this bottom bit. Then the bottom bit, um, then you can verify this. It's going to be one of the exercises. The bottom bit has this op uh, function. So it has some bits from the key, which we don't know. It has a 1, and it has only the 32 bits, or the, um, the first bit of y in here. And, well, okay, you check on this one bit a bunch of times, you vary your inputs, and then you see whether you always have, well, if bit 32 is the same, you always get the same bit. And you shouldn't have that the bottom bit only de depends on the 32nd bit of the, the input. So that's, again, a distinguisher from a POP. If you look at higher order bits, well, I already said, okay, well, from, from here you have a carry, and so when, you, when you're looking at the next bit, there you start having linear functions because we're using plus and not XOR, and it goes higher and higher and higher. But because there is no right shift in there, funny enough, the bottom bit is never affected. You can actually trace this through in a bit more detail. So uh, oh, first of all, the um, direction here is if you're looking at the normal TA, so then you're having the shift right here instead of the shift left. That one is taking the higher bits updates and also moving them to the lower bits. So remember that that was a thing where the B0 till B4 were falling off and suddenly the B5 comes in and affects the bottom bit. And so if B5 has gotten some nonlinear input, then now this comes in and affects the bottom bit of well, X or of Y. In the left shift, we do notice that we have a diffusion from the low bits. So the, the left thing is always ensuring that, well, changes in the bottom bits get percolated to the tall high bits, and also I already mentioned the carries. So, okay, left TA is also a problem. So TA is really using the right shift and the left shift. And now, depending on how you feel about designing systems or not, you might go like, hey, thank you for showing me. This is not the area I want to get in. This is way too, too dangerous, I might just mess up. 
And that is a valid thing. There's a lot of statements saying, do not roll your own crypto. On the other hand, well, we need some cryptography, so somebody has to roll their own crypto. Now, nobody, nobody should roll their own crypto and then just use it and not have review about it. It's very important to well, publish your systems, talk about it, get other people to review it, but there has to be a way to write your crypto systems. And so, well, stay on if you're interested in how to do this. And uh, there are several groups. We also have now Tomas, who you have seen in the first few videos, who is an expert on cryptanalysis uh, and nasty math courses. You can also get lots of information about this. So, yep, it is known, but there's also a lot of, well, digging into the details. So let's do another dig into the details. Again, starting with the real thing and then doing one small modification. Okay, this is kind of obvious. Uh, so we're going from TA with 32 rounds to TA4 with just four rounds. This is a typical thing when you're building a cipher that you like building it in a round-based way. For one thing, it's easier to design. It's short on the slides and then just doing a lot of these iterations. But you need to decide how many rounds you need. Now, four, we will see, is definitely too small. But then the question is, well, is 32 necessary? Is this overkill? And there I go for the, well, on the side of caution. If there's something known up to this many rounds, yeah, go, give yourself a good margin and do many rounds because symmetric cryptography is so fast that you barely notice the cost of this. There's a lot of, well, starting this whole thing and then just doing a few more rounds won't add so much. Of course, you might have people who talk about bleeding edge security. That wouldn't be my advice. Now, if you look at the TA4, it's going to be another exercise for the sheet, then you will notice that after just four rounds, you can have a relation, which, well, is, a, is an example of a differential relation, that if you input has this feature that your x and y are the same except for one bit. So the, the most significant bit of x is different between those, and otherwise that they have, they're the same. Those two share the first bit of the output. Okay, so you get yourself a bunch of samples and you try this. And if you see this relationship, then you say, no, this is not, this is TA4, this is not a PRP. Why is this happening? So if you're looking at what happens with these two inputs, so if you're tracing through the differences in the x and y's, so we're starting with x, y, or we're starting with x plus 31 x, uh, comma, y. And so when we get in, then the x, well, has a difference of 2 to 32. And then after the computation of y, there's also a difference calculated into the y part. Um, at this point, the 31 has shifted out of sight by the multiplication, so by the, by the left shift, and it has shifted down by 5 bits from the right shift. So instead of having a difference in 2 to 31, we now have a difference in 2 to 26. And there might be other differences higher up, but the bottom bits are not affected. The top first bit that is affected is the 2 to the 26. Okay, now this modified y comes in, the modified y difference comes in and affects this here. Again, the shifting up, okay, from 26 now to 30, but we already assuming that there is something else happening. The shifting down, so the 26 going to 21. So this is going to be the bottom bit that's different. And you see that each time this is going down by 5, sorry, going down by 5 this way, so going down by 10 in the vertical direction. So from the difference at 31, after four rounds, we're left with a one difference. That means the bottom bit is not affected. So the bottom bit is affected in Y, so we don't see anything here. But the bottom bit of the differences here is not affected. And so, well, if you're trying enough examples, you will convince yourself that this is not a random thing. So you say you're trying two inputs, then... For a uniform random function, you would have probability one half. For a TA4, you will have probability one of having the full bit. If you're looking at two pairs, then okay, they will have uh, one quarter probability of having the same bit for a random function, and well, both of them will be the same for a TA4. 
So the advantage, so the, the difference of what you would get anyway and what you get this way grows with the number of pairs you see. So what you're seeing here is an example of a differential attack. You're tracing through um, differences between the inputs and see how they affect the outputs. And then you're saying, hey, this is a property that we can see in the outputs which wouldn't affect, uh, which wouldn't be there in a random function. Of course, this is a very extreme one because it's a teaching example. If you would do this for uh, more rounds, it disappears. Um, but sometimes you can say, okay, well, it's not a probability of one difference, but it's a probability of 20% or something which you could then amplify by doing it many more rounds. And again, you distinguish um, the block cipher you're looking at from a random block cipher. Final tweak, um, again, starting with the real thing and then just saying, well, okay, 30, now we have seen that four rounds is dangerous. Let's go for overkill. Let's do a thousand round. And that's how I would sell this to you. But I also did another change. Let's see what I did there. So I'm changing the R less than 32 to R less than 1000, but I'm also changing the place where the C is defined. Yeah, like, I mean, since we're going for overkill on the C's, let's just, uh, on the rounds, let's just keep C constant. So now in the repetition TA, I have moved the C outside. There's no more updates of C. But hey, a thousand rounds. Okay, so we plug in our X and Y's and we're doing stuff to them and we're doing stuff to them. There is still the addition with C, so that hasn't disappeared. Um, so that's also important because you can, you, you actually introduce new bits, not just based on the key, but also on the constant. Um, but is it good? Well, since in this lecture it's not good, um, so what can we see here? Let's first abstract to what are we actually looking at. So the rep t is now a iterative function where we're doing a thousand iterations and the iterations are all the same. Before each iteration has a new C, so I would have um, 32 different functions, but now this is just one function applied a thousand times. So let's call this iteration function uppercase i, and the uppercase i sub k for it takes the t and does one update to x, one update to y, and does this a thousand times. Okay, well, now let's throw a whole lot of data at this. So let's do, say, 2 to the 32 different inputs. And I'm looking at the outputs of those. So we're now building ourselves a big table of 2 to the 32 pairs, input and output. And then, well, there's only 64 bits in the block, so it could well be that there is some input B in the list that, well, one iteration further, so not a thousand, not a full rep tier on this that you could see from the outside, but you can't actually see whether this is the case. So, but let's assume that the next input, so that the B in list also has that A is in the list. So just one iteration later. There are 2 to the 64 total, and we're looking at 2 to the 32. But it's also an easy property, and well, each of those has a chance. And well, if this is the case, then this percolates through the next iteration. So, well, then we're doing a thousand iteration on A, we're doing a thousand iterations on B, so one application of rep T. And so then we have again this relation. And you would have it again after the next iteration, after the next iteration, and so on. Okay, we don't know whether this pair exists, and we don't know where it is. But what we can do is, well, we just take each pair, assume it holds, and do the computation. So for each B and A in this list, we solve in this equation. I mean, each iteration function is, is very, very simple. So if it's correct that the B input here is equal to the A as an output, we get information about the keys. Well, this only gives us 32 bits of the key, uh, 64 bits of the key that can't get us more than that because, well, X and Y together have only 64 bits, so A and B have only 64 bits. But then we do this also after one iteration. 
And well, we have the iteration in our list. That's exactly what we have in our list. So we're looking also at those two numbers. And well, we assume that those were a distance apart, one distance apart, and then these are one distance apart. And this gives us essentially enough to figure out the key, or we have to do some more steps. At least now we have a key candidate. Let me test the key candidate. Because, well, we know under the proper key, we have a bunch of inputs output pairs. And well, typically it doesn't work. So we moved on to the next pair. So for each pair, we're doing uh, two pieces of the key recovery. So these are uh, pretty easy systems of equations. We're recovering the key from it, or well, candidate key. We test the key and we move on. So there are 2 to the 64 different pairs. So it's cost 2 to the 64 operations. But 2 to the 64 is a lot smaller than the key space. So two, the key space is 128 bits. So we would have to try 2 to the 128 to try them all. Now, this is an example of what we call in cryptanalysis a slide attack. So if you have um, a function which you also get kind of as part of the function at the next step, um, then you can apply this and see whether you can get relations here and here and here and here. Now, TA is not vulnerable to this because TA doesn't actually have the C. Uh, outside C is in the inside and gets updated each time. But, well, this is a teaching example to see what could go wrong. All right, this was the last of the um, examples of how it could break. So I hope this gave you some idea of what cryptanalysis of symmetric key could be.